All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our next session is There is No DEIA Without Disability by Lauren Miller, Alternate Media and Assistive Technology Specialist at the CCC Accessibility Center. In this presentation, Lauren will discuss DEIA principles and how they differ from DEI and how to foster an environment that does not treat disability and accessibility as an afterthought or inconvenience. All right, Lauren, I'm going to stop screen sharing and you can take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right, I am going to share my screen. And let me put everything in here. All right, so can everyone see that? Yes. All right, All right. so um, as mentioned by Lisa, um, my workshop today is there is no DEIA without disability. Basically, you know, accessibility and disability is not an afterthought. So we're gonna go to the next slide. So just a little bit about myself today. Um, well, first I am a um, African-American um, middle-aged female. I am um, dark brown skin and I am wearing a black and white uh, polka dot sweater cardigan. And I also have clear uh, frame glasses and dark curly hair. Um, I have been in DSPS for over eight years, starting at Los Angeles Harbor College. And I'm currently the Alt Media and Assistive Technology Specialist for the CCC Accessibility Center. Um, and one of my models that I like to say is that, um, you know, providing accessibility from the heart. And today, you know, I want to make it a little less technical. I want this to be more of a conversation. So really, please feel free to put any questions and comments um, in the chat throughout the presentation so that, you know, we can kind of talk about this so you don't have to necessarily wait to the end of the presentation to ask any questions. Okay, now we're going to slide number three. So just the overview of today, again, just discussing DEIA principles and how they do differ from DEI. And then also, how are you able to foster this environment that, you know, keeps you from treating disability and accessibility as an inconvenience or as an afterthought to where it is always embedded um, throughout anything that you do in your institution and at your campus. So first thing I want to do, I want to ask for some definitions of disability. Now, what is your definition? You can put in the chat. Now, and there's no right or wrong answers. So just, you know, some things that um, when you think of the word disability, what do you think of? Okay, uh, needs accessibility uh, accommodations. Um, someone else mentioned something that interferes with your inability to do something. Okay, a life condition. Okay, um, limitations of any kind, real or perceived. Oh, yes, an inherent quality that makes it hard uh, to interact with some external systems. A physical or mental condition that limits a person's movement, senses, or activities. Yes, and cognitive, yes, all of that. Great. Thank you for the definitions. They were all really good. And they all make sense, and they all are correct. Like I so said, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, so disability could be anything. but um, actually, I want to also go through what the technical ADA definition of disability is, and it's to be protected um, by the ADA in the United States or American with Disabilities Act. Disability must fit the following description, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. So really, it's anything that affects your day-to-day -day life, uh, your ability to perform your daily activities is a disability. Um, and it could mean so many things. It's just not just people in wheelchairs. Um, roughly speaking, the umbrella term disability includes people with any significant physical, cognitive, mental health, learning, hearing, seeing, or communication impairments. Um, and it could be visible, they could be are invisible. And actually the majority of disabilities are invisible. And most people don't disclose them um, if they do have them. Another way to also look at disability is whether it's permanent or temporary, um, so you might have um, someone that might have just broken their arm or their ankle and it's going to be healed. But during that time, they do have that disability. Um, and then another way to also look at it that people do is between the medical and the social model. 
of disability. So the medical model focuses more on disability as this medical experience. It's this set of impairments to be treated um, with the goal being something to like, you want to get as close to normal functioning as possible. And I put normal in quotes because, you know, when you say normal, then the other part is abnormal and the disability is not necessarily abnormal. It's just what it is. Um, but the social model views disability as this matter of like combating discrimination, ensuring e equal access or equity, uh, and making sure that disabled people have the support to sustain the independence that they want, and also just live lives on their own terms. So in general, the medical model places this responsibility for um, the improvement on the disabled individual and then their own personal efforts. But the social model, in contrast, it really emphasizes that collective action and the social responsibility that we have as a society just to make things better and just more accepting of disabled people, both as a group and individually. Um, so one way that, you know, you can kind of see that difference between medical and social model of disability is just how the differences between disability organizations, like some focus on raising money for cures or treatments or just on that um, individual education of self-improvement and motivation, while others emphasize the advocacy, the activism, and just building a greater sense of communication, uh, community and pride among people with disabilities. Uh, and then just able people themselves for the most part, when they think about their disabilities at all, um, really kind of gravitate toward that self-help and the normalizing approach or that collaborative and activist approach to disability. So as you can see, there's really a lot of different ways of understanding disability and the community is it's just not definitive. There's no, like I said, no one way to think about it and there's no right or wrong way. Um, a lot of times it just really is up to that person that is disabled. So now we're going to go over to slide five. And just a little bit about disabilities like by the numbers. So there's an estimated 1 billion people or 15% of the worldwide population that lives with a disability. And they say 26%, one in four in the U.S. has a disability. Um, it's especially common um, in older women, um, and, I mean, sorry, older adults, women, and minorities. And then actually during the 2021-2022 um, school year, the SPS students accounted for 5.3% of the population by California community colleges. And like I mentioned before, above, you know, um, sometimes they do not disclose, it may be invisible. So just think, many times students don't disclose it. So those numbers are likely to be a lot higher. Um, and with those numbers, you can also kind of assume that at least one in four staff and faculty at the community colleges also have a disability, whether or not they choose to disclose that information, okay? So we're gonna go to slide six. Disability and diversity. So there has kind of been this push to recognize that disability is diversity. Um, if you were to type that into Google, you will see campaigns, um, you will see a Twitter hashtag that is being used um, for to recognize that disability is another part of diversity, another cultural um, category that um, people do look at and should look at. And you know, then the discussions regarding diversity are like usually focused on gender and race. But as we know, the disability community is really uh, diverse. Um, and it's often said that disability does not discriminate. It covers all sorts of people. It covers all the racial lines, gender, educational, and social uh, socioeconomic lines. So um, like I said, it's another part of diversity. And it also constitutes the largest underserved group in the country. Um, so if you do not currently have a disability, you have about a 20% chance of becoming disabled at some point in your life. Um, so it intersects with all our uh, in, um, historically disadvantaged and underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Um, as we mentioned before on the next page before that, you know, um, disability is especially common in what they call minorities, but, you know, kind of the majority. And then also um, just being disabled, like I say, is this that one group that you do not have to be born into? Like we, you know, we're born into our, our race and our ethnicity. But with this um, disability, you don't have to be born into it because you can become disabled at any time. You can go um, all of your life without a disability and something could um, happen to where you do have a disability later on. I'll go to slide number seven. And we're just gonna do like a, just a quick poll break. Um, and I'm going to put the poll up. And the question is, has your campus or organization implemented a DEI initiative? And I'll just give you, uh, you know, about 30 seconds to um, answer that. And it is anonymous um, for the poll. 
And is it yes, um, no, or are you unsure? Um, and you know, DEI initiatives and efforts can come in many forms. So that can be like hiring a DEI officer, creating a DEI task force, promoting DEI workshops and trainings. So does, has your campus or organization implemented any type of uh, the things that I've mentioned? Have they hired a DEI officer or you know, done some workshops and trainings? Okay. Okay, a lot of yeses, some unsures. Interesting, no, no. So it's either yes, okay. It's either yes or unsure. Um, interesting. Okay. So it's about, looks about 63, yes, and the rest unsure. Okay, hold on. The numbers have changed a little bit and then we'll stop in a, a couple of seconds. Okay, so about 73% are saying yes and the rest are just unsure and 0% for no, okay? So I keep saying DEI and DEIA. So let's go over what does DEI even mean? So according to the Center for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement, um, it's these different communities and cultures and geographical areas. They use a variety of acronyms to indicate the space that includes diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, justice, and belonging are some combination of these terms. So it can be, um, you know, when I say DEI for diversity, equity, and inclusion, it can kind of indicate um, those different words in between. They should indicate it. Um, some might leave, you know, put it in, some might leave it out, but for the most part, it should be like a combination of these different terms. So as we go to uh, slide nine, um, these are different diversity acronyms. So you can have DNI, which is just diversity and inclusion. You can have DEI, as I mentioned, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then you have DEIA, which I'm talking about today, but for so, not say for some reason, but some places actually put the A of anti-racism. So it might be diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism and not accessibility. Um, you might have DEIB, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. You have EDI, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. You have IDEA, <laughs> inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, accessibility, but access. And then you have JEDI, with justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And then also someone in the chat put DEIAA, which again, that can be diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, and accessibility. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of say it. And, um, you know, there's so many acronyms, there's so many labels for these DEI initiatives and these terms. So you have justice, you have equity, you have diversity, and they're routinely underdefined, they're conflated, they are really robbed of the, their differences and uh, specific, sorry, specificities. Um, but these terms and related abbreviations can sometimes kind of come to be treated as like these buzzwords. They're, um, they're more slogan and kind of like the substance. And like sometimes the institutions can fail to meaningfully honor these terms and really um, put forth um, efforts that truly are DEI, DEIA initiative. And it's important that we are attentive, attentive to the meanings of these words and what they entail. In addition, not all explicitly mention accessibility, like I said. So are we to assume that they do include disability and accessibility in their efforts? We want to assume that, but we can't. We're gonna talk about why. So in slide number 10, DEI without disability. It is said that 90% of organizations claim to prioritize diversity, but only 4% consider disabilities in those initiatives. So really organizations, they're clearly investing more in DEI and include, you know, efforts, but that while each term um, DEI often means that advocates aren't accounting for accessibility. Often when organizations consider DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion efforts, the first thing that comes to their mind is gender, race, religion, so while yes, DEI should cover these categories, there also needs to be the disability inclusion. And like I mentioned above, like sometimes the A stands for anti-racism instead of accessibility, which then again erases disability. 
some other examples of disability and accessibility being left out of DEI efforts. It can include an organization presenting a DEI conference online without ASL interpreters or captions, or they only include them if an attendee specifically asks for them. Um, or also maybe having a DEI meeting on the second floor of a building that does not have an elevator, or the elevator is broken, or in a building without ramp, or even in a room without accessible desks or furniture. So we can't continue to assume that inclusive automatically means accessible. Um, if accessibility is about making sure all people, um, regardless of disability status or medical need, have the tools necessary to enjoy the same products and services that others, including me ensuring that there's a seat available for them and that I, there's opportunities for them to contribute. We are like organizing our meetings as we organize events and just different webinars. You know, we usually have a checklist of what we want to remember. Like we want to order enough tables. We want to order enough chairs if it's in person. Or if it's on Zoom, we want to make sure our Zoom settings are working. So why isn't accessibility always included in that? Why is that not on our checklist? Why haven't we put that, you know, integrated to our event planning? Again, why is it sometimes regulated as an afterthought? We think about it after someone maybe asks about it or mentions it. Um, after someone said, oh, are you going to have an ASL interpreter? Oh, yeah, we do need one. And then now we're scrambling to find an ASL interpreter. Or, um, you know, I might have an issue with, um, you know, getting up the stairs. And it's upstairs, there's no elevator. Oh, now we had to change the room. There's no rooms available. So we're scrambling. So again, we want to put this at the beginning and not scrambling at the end and make it seem again, like an afterthought or some type of inconvenience. So I want to show a figure um, that was presented by the Community College League of California, which I thought was really um, awesome and really just a simple, um, simple figure. So one is DEIA versus DEI. So as they define the DEI, um, you know, you're cultivating diversity, you're promoting equity, and you're fostering inclusion. Well, the EIA figure, it just as ensuring accessibility. So while you're fostering that inclusion, you're cultivating your diversity, and you're promoting your equity, you are ensuring your accessibility. You're accommodating, but you're also making sure that you have something there for them, you know, to accommodate. You want to make sure that you're removing those barriers for them. They're getting that same access to um I like participate, but you also want to make sure it is accessible. So they might be able to get into the room, but then they might not be able to hear. They may not have the ASL interpreter. So you think about everything when it comes to it. Um, it comes to like um, inclusion and equity. Okay, so we're going to go to slide number 12. So I want to define accessibility a little bit. I keep talking about it. Why does it need to be included with DEI? Let's just kind of like define it. Um, it's the practice of making information. Um, activities and our environment sensible, meaningful, and usable for as many people as possible. Um, that's the technical term. You know, like, why do we need the A in DEI to explicitly mean accessibility? There was a really good quote that I found by Tiffany Yu, and she's the CEO of Diversability. And it says, many are still viewing accessibility as compliance or an afterthought rather than at the core part of the human experience. And when access is embedded, in the culture of what we're building, we make things better for everyone, which I do agree. So we say that we gave a technical term of accessibility, but what does it really truly mean? And as we go to slide 13, number one, it's situational. It depends on the situation. What may be accessible for one may not be accessible for all. Captions may be provided, but if they're not accurate, um, that doesn't work. If all text is not labeled correctly, it's not accessible. Um, a video on the website, it may be accessible to people that are blind if the video player is able to be controlled using a keyboard, if all the controls are labeled correctly, and if all the content in the video is available as audio. But if it's not, there's no caption, if there's no text transcripts available, then the video is going to be inaccessible to someone that can't hear the audio. Um, if the content is complicated, it also may be as inaccessible to someone with a learning disability. So if there's an issue with the technology, such as a screen reader, then it will be, again, inaccessible to a person using that technology. So like I said, it depends kind of on the situation. So you might have, um, like I said, content is uh, complicated. So it might be accessible in the fact that it might have transcripts available, it might have audio, but situationally, um, for someone who has a learning disability, it's not accessible for them because the content has not maybe been broken down or put into layman's terms. So you want to look at it not just for a for the technology side of it, but just all parts of accessibility. 
again, now we want to go into the recognizing the different ability levels. So it's the ability part. People functional abilities vary hugely. So sight and your hearing ranges from perfect to none with the spectrum in between. People's literacy levels and their memory vary. They're due to like, you know, common uh, conditions such as dyslexia, autism, dementia, and even stress, you know, can kind of affect their, you know, their ability to remember things and to concentrate. Um, you have to remember their physical ability. It may vary with differences in mobility um, and also in their strength and levels of pain. You know, one thing I thought about like for campuses, are we considering their energy levels and capability um, for faculty uh, when it's like when you have to move campus offices or assign faculty classrooms? Um, are faculty even given a choice in their classroom location sometime based on their own needs? In addition to students, um, are you seeing what um, faculty may need? Like if you're placing an instructor with decreased mobility in a classroom that is far from parking or from accessible parking, how does that affect their day-to-day -day, day -day activity on campus? So again, are we thinking about those things as we are assigning classrooms or as we're creating meetings? Um, another part is the awareness you know, increasing awareness and promoting the normalization of including accessibility and not waiting for accommodation requests. It's usually the lack of awareness that most commonly results in things not being accessible. Um, another really good example, um, always including ASL interpreters at graduation ceremonies or uh, events on campus. It's, it's not only for any hard of hearing or deaf students, it could also be for any guests that may attend. And you may not know ahead of time if they need ASL interpreting, but because you have that interpreter already there and reserved, they'll be able to follow along with the ceremony for their family member or their friend. So as we go to slide number 14, and I want to ask this question because um, because my, I, I have a disability and I have always tried to some, you know, be somewhat open with that. Um, I have an ADHD and um, I also kind of call it my superpower as well, but I do know it does sometimes make things, um, I'm gonna say harder, but you know, I just have to do things a little differently. And um, I've always tried to be open with students when I worked in DSPS because I wanted them to see that um, even with a disability, um, you can still be um, in a part of, let's say, a place of leadership or power. Um, so I want to ask this question. Does your campus or organization have persons with disabilities in leadership roles outside of DSPS? So we're going to do another poll. Again, it is anonymous. I'll give you a couple seconds to kind of answer that. And another reason why I ask this question is because it's been so, uh, shown that over one in three people show this unconscious bias against those with a disability, uh, which is higher than the levels of bias on the basis of gender or race. And it can kind of lead, um, this unconscious bias can lead disabled people to be overlooked for projects and promotions and positions of leadership would not, not only affects the work environment, also the student experience. So, um, you know, since that's, that's the case, why are disability and accessibility still continue to be overlooked in DEI? You know, disabled people belong to every department, every leader of leadership, in all spaces where decisions are being made. Or as I mentioned above, you can be dis from disabled at any time. So how is your organization creating this environment that supports an employee returning to work after a stroke or even after effects of long COVID, which I'm still also dealing with as well? Okay, so I'm looking at the poll. And... The majority actually is saying unsure, so it might be invisible, or they might not even feel comfortable um, saying they have a disability. No, and very little 2% are saying yes. So I just happened to start working in DSPS, um, and you know, then I was actually, actually after I started working in DSPS is when I was um, went to the doctor and was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, but uh, like I said, it does tend to see that some organizations um, usually have those with like either a visible disability or that are out with their disabilities in those roles inside of DSPS. So we're looking for now, like I said, we want dis um, people with disabilities to be kind of all over the campus, like not to be overlooked for any pro for any projects. They can be in any office. They can be in any level of leadership and they can be in any space, like I said, where decisions are being made. So that's why I just kind of just wanted to get an idea of what's kind of going on in our on our campuses and our institutions throughout um, the state. So we're gonna go to slide number five and just talk a little bit about how DEIA also contributes to student success because at the end of the day, 
um, our focus is on student success. So I want to discuss that. How can it contribute to their success? Well, number one, it enhances their educational experience. As I mentioned before, I have disclosed before to some students that were um, feeling um, like wary about either joining DSPS or using our services or just feeling there's some type of stigma with having um, a disability. And I have disclosed with certain cases just to kind of give them that motivation so they can kind of see themselves in me and see where I've gone and been able to advance in my education and, you know, receive these degrees and different things and getting these positions. Um, so college students are more diverse than ever and they bring with them so many um just a different wide variety of experiences and their perspectives and their backgrounds. And, you know, by having a culturally diverse this classroom and social interaction, and when I say culturally diverse, I include disability in that, you know, when they are able to have those interactions, they have this opportunity to learn from people with different backgrounds and upbringing. And it also leads to increased innovation and collaboration for students with disabilities and without. It also improves their communication and thought processing skills. Um, like I said, they're presented with these uh, daily opportunities to interact with each other and these different backgrounds, these varying, varying backgrounds, and it enables them to learn to communicate more effectively and just often differently than they are previously accustomed to, um, especially if you do have a student without disability that is maybe in a group uh, with a student with a um and hearing impairment. So like I said, they're communicating in a different way. They're learning. They might even learn a couple of signs. That's something they could bring to them. They might even get interested even more in ASL, um, American Sign Language or Sign Language Interpreting from that. And it also just challenges stereotypes. You know, for many students, regardless of whether or not they identify as being disabled, college, you know, it it challenges these stereotypes that they, and these norms that they may have already developed before they got to college. And when they're presented with the opportunity to critically um, explore these experiences, they become more accepting and just more thoughtful members of society. And lastly, you know, representation matters. Students are able to see themselves in their instructors, in the staff, and in the campus leaders. Um, and having a culturally diverse peer is not the only way that they benefit from having diversity of campus. They get the chance to see and experience those various leadership styles from those that um, may be disabled um, faculty or disabled staff or administrators. And it also helps to increase the retention and completion rates when they see themselves in those in uh, uh, different levels of leadership and power on that um, institution. And it gives them a chance to just see someone from a similar background that they can look up to, someone they can emulate. Um, and this is just really impactful for students with from historically under, under, underrepresented communities, which includes disability. Um, and then we're considering those that we employ within our campus communities. It's just really critical that we ensure that the demographics of those that we employ are representative, representative of the student body. And then as we go to uh, slide number 16, just talk a little bit about, so what's the institutional responsibility? Well, first, it just needs to, disability inclusion needs to start from the top, um, from the state to the district, to the campus levels, Accessibility and disability inclusion should always be considered, um, whether it's in a board meeting, whether it's in district emails, just from the top down. Um, another thing, you want to extend those DEIA efforts beyond checking boxes and complying with laws. Um, you know, the ADA is the bare minimum. It's, so just adhering to the guidelines is not enough. Um, you know, don't just focus on checking boxes. It becomes problematic because you approach accessibility as solely a compliance problem or issue, rather than really um, taking on this time to kind of innovate and just really think of ways to integrate accessibility into your institution. And like I said, you want to integrate um, accessibility to every system and process from your Canvas, LTI, from emails, new letters, flyers. When you integrate accessibility into your organizational processes, it becomes consistently implemented. It becomes second nature. Um, across your campus and really should make accessible document trains mandatory. Anyone that is uh, sending out blast emails, um, anyone that is creating memos, creating reports, any of those, they should really know how to make accessible documents, not just those um, that might um, be like a, a receptionist or a secretary, everyone should learn. Um, you also make sure that all your videos are captioned, not just though they're going to be used in a classroom or um, on, you know, on Canvas, all of the videos, anything that's hosted on the website. And you want to provide trainings on accessibility tools that are already available on campus computers and explain how they work. Um, Microsoft and um, Apple, a lot of them already have their own internal um, 
tools, accessibility tools that are already there, like uh, text to speech, screen readers, just everything. And it kind of goes into my next point of incorporating universal design into all aspects of, of campus life. You know, everyone's brain works differently and learners, they have different backgrounds and abilities and needs. So having those multiple options for learning and understanding should really be provided um, so that everyone can successfully get the information that they need and acquire their knowledge. So for example, a person who isn't visually impaired may still appreciate like a larger font or even the option to listen to a lecture instead of reading it. And that goes also for like students. Um, you might have a student who is currently um, have a new baby and she needs to listen to her lecture um, and, you know, I'm mean, sorry, read the lecture. And, you know, she may not be able to listen. She can't have it loud. So having those transcripts or having those captions on is also helpful for her, even though she may not have a disability. So that's where we come into the universal design side of it. And then um, as we go to slide number 17, so what are some kind of some do's and don'ts when you have these DEIA efforts and initiatives? Well, number one, um, you don't want to plan or present any disability focused initiatives and content without input for people who actually have disabilities. But on the other hand, you don't want to also assume that disabled people inside your organization are just waiting to provide content or leadership. Um, if they are willing, make sure you compensate, compensate them fairly for their extra work. Um, and it really just should not be just the responsibility of people with disabilities to teach everyone about the experience. But, you know, change does happen when people are able to work together and learn from each other. But you also still want to be careful about um, tokenism and this inspiration and sensationalism. You know, you want to, you know, say, oh, you're so um, brave and I'm so proud of you for having a disability and coming to work every day. And it's like they're just living their lives. Um, and you just also want to allow disabled individuals to decide, do they want to be the face of disability inclusion on your campus or your institution? Um, and then also, no, if they do kind of want to be the face, their voice does not speak for everyone. Um, one disabled person is, is just that one disabled person and totally different from the next one. So what they may find offensive may be different from someone else and so on. Um, you also want to make sure you don't want to use offensive analogies and equate ableism with other forms of prejudice or discrimination like racism or sexism um, or, or transphobia or any of those. Yes, there may be some similarity, but for the most part, um, you know, they might overlap and compound each other, but ableism is not just parallel to racism or other prejudice. They all operate and affect people differently. So, and also be mindful of comparing disabilities with other everyday hardships. Permanent disabilities isn't the same as a temporary impairment, you know, like a broken leg or needing glasses. Um, and while disability frequently overlaps with poverty um, and lack of education, and other social disadvantages, they're not the same and they don't always go together. And another thing, you just really want to normalize that culture of disability inclusion and hold conversations beyond race. Um, you want to help create a better culture of inclusion where people aren't afraid to talk about the disability status or ask for their accommodation. And that's another reason why I asked about the question about those in leadership outside of DSPS. Um, like I said, so some people might have a disability, but they might be afraid to talk about it. You know, like if it's an invisible disability, they might not feel comfortable or feel like it's something that would be um, taken well on their campus. So really the key to understand disabled people is just to really interact and listen to them, you know, don't focus on your own limited exposure to something that may seem similar to a disability. Um, you really, to better understand the relationship be between ableism and other forms of prejudice and discrimination, it's really important to just listen um, to people who experience that disability along with their other marginalized identities. And another thing is speak up, you know, if you see something wrong, but also just kind of know when to be quiet um, and let them have their voice. So, come to the end of uh, my presentation today, and I hope I have provided with a lot of just information. Um, you know, I can talk about this forever, it can go more and more. So, I just kind of really want to do an overview just to kind of get an idea of what you should try to include on your campus. Um, but, any questions, any thoughts, anything that um, made you think about today? Um, and actually, let me go back a little bit. Um, there was one, I really wanted to talk about some resources, but there was a, a really awesome, um, I think, yeah, it's, who is it? It's a college, hold on really quick. 
Orange Coast College. They have a really awesome DEI um, plan that I have added to resources that I think a lot of campuses could really um, you utilize um, as they come up with their DEIA plan. So definitely make sure you check that out. Okay, so we have a question in chat. What is your general recommendations to build cultures that allow for faculty, staff, and administrators to become more open? For example, should events allow for multiple ways to participate? I would say yes. Um, I gave an ex kind of example of, you know, you might have an employee that was out for COVID. They may have long COVID now. They might still be working from home. Um, so, you know, have a hybrid board meeting, have a hybrid staff meeting, have a hybrid faculty um, department meeting uh, where it's on Zoom and also in person and gives them a, a, a chance to kind of decide um, you know, they might be having a bad day. Like I said, they might still be working from home, but others are on campus now. So definitely I would say that if, if you can't, if it's very, you know, feasible, try to do these hybrid type of um, participation. Also, when you think about, say, for instance, if you're having like a, um, a kind of this uh, get together, you want to think about your icebreakers. Uh, think about any type of activity that ask someone to stand up or do a lot of activity. Think of some things that can be done um, possibly sitting apart from each other or sitting down because um, it may be someone that can't necessarily stand up, might be mobile or they, at that day, they might be really in pain and, and unable to participate or might put them in a lot more pain to participate. So also really think about that when you are, um, you know, doing any type of planning for your meetings or anything on campus. Okay, any, I'll uh, see other questions. Oh, like someone said also, putting your heart at the center of your practice as you do is the way to go. Exactly. Oh, and then also Orange Coast College, um, oh, sorry, North Orange uh, Continuing Education, they develop an accessibility advisory committee um, based on attending some of our workshops. And it's a committee under their DEIA, which is under the president's cabinet. And they are currently finalizing their accessibility school wide plan. And their committee includes managers, staff, faculty, and students, which is awesome. And that's also um, Orange Coast College, their DIA plan. When I looked at their task force, their um, task force and their group also included students, faculty, staff, and administrators, which I thought was really awesome. Okay, um, another question. When you are describing yourself at the start of a presentation, either online or in person, what are some key areas to describe of oneself, height, age, race, and ethnicity, clothes? I think for the most part, this. Uh, I would say maybe your approximate age, uh, race, ethnicity, and clothes or anything that might kind of set you apart, just kind of give them a visual um, or just an idea of uh, a way that they can kind of construct in their head what you may look like. Um, you know, you don't have to go really deep into it, but just, like I said, just I kind of describe like my hair and my glasses and my skin color um, and, you know, middle age and that. Yeah, so you don't have to go True, but it's not just the key points, important parts. You don't necessarily have to do height, um, especially like on Zoom. So we're sitting, so you kind of just see our uh, head up or neck up anyway. So that's definitely not necessarily, but yes, age it can always, or age range, um, you know, race, ethnicity, or skin color. Um, um, but if you want to, you know, because sometimes skin color can be different for different races and different ethnicities. So if you just kind of want to go into your actual background ethnicity as well, it's good. Okay, any other questions that we have? Okay, there's one. Um, any general tips for handling conflicting accommodations? Interesting, okay. For example, if someone is hearing impaired and needs a speaker to be louder, but someone with a sensory processing issue will be hindered by that volume. Okay, so I know in classrooms, um, you have uh, where some instructors, um, you can have a student where they can instructor can wear the amplifier, and they can go straight into the students like their, their ear. Um, so that could be helpful um, for handling some like a conflicting accommodation such as that. Um, because if you were to use like that speaker throughout the whole classroom, um, it might possibly bother someone that had the sensory processing issue. So like I said, maybe you can have the instructor wear the amplifier and then the student that needs it, the hearing impaired student that does need that speaker to be louder, we will go straight into their ear and not throughout the class. And the class will just hear this the instructor at their 
um, kind of, I'll say regular, but you know, regular speaking tone. And then the hearing impaired student would get the amplified version right to their ear. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Oh, okay. Suggestions on renaming traditionally titled DSPS office accommodation offices. Okay. Well, um, this is my own personal um, thoughts about it. And it does not, you know, represent other thoughts of, you know, the CCC Accessibility Center or any place. But for me, I feel like, the, you know, disability is not a dirty word. It's okay to say disabled or disability. And um, I personally am okay with DSPS as of someone with a disability. Um, so I say, ask the students, ask them how they feel. Um, ask them if they want a name, you know, would prefer a name change. Are they okay with it still being DSPS? Because for some people with disability, that is their identity. They are okay with saying, I am a disabled person. That's that difference between identity first and person first language. They're okay with that. They're okay with you um, using that identity first for them. So, um, you know, grasp and um, don't kind of just assume because I have kind of seen, and not necessarily with DSP, DSPS offices, but just other places, um, people kind of change these names and um, make these kind of like, um, I don't say cutesy names to make themselves feel better, but does it make the disabled person feel better, the person that's actually coming to the office? So you really just want to, just want to ask. So um, yeah, someone said they worked at SDSU and they he named the Student Disability Service Center to Student Ability Success Center. And they worked there and a lot of people were angry. They preferred to have the word disabled, um, disability in the title. Okay, and then someone else now in this chat says, from their DSPS is now Student Access Services and their students did participate in the name change. So see, it just all depends on their campuses. Um, so, it, you know, sometimes not changing it, as someone just mentioned in the um, chat, is that it helps those with disabilities find the information that they need. So sometimes student access or student success center can kind of be synonymous with like another office. So they may not know that is the DSPS office. Um, someone else in the chat just said, their department is still the same name, but the building that they were in was changed from disabled. Okay. And then someone just said, yeah, changing the name. But doing nothing won't help anyone. Exactly. So the biggest thing is that what are you doing as a department? What are you doing as an office? Um, it's okay to have the, you know, the different name and change these names. Student Resource Center, Accessibility Center for Education. These are, you know, some, I guess, really awesome names. But are you making sure that you're still just helping those students with those disabilities? That's the main important part about it. So that's my thought for that. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, just a couple of things to remember uh, for um, in our next meeting of our CCC Community of Accessibility Allies, or C4A2. The next meeting is February 15th, and that's going to be from 1030 to 1130. Um, and we will have some breakout rooms by areas of interest. Um, whether procurement, digital content, web, DSPS, or all media. And we have added the to join the listserv and get receive the information. Um, we have put that listserv email into the chat. And then also remember, you know, um, we have so many resources and I have added the resources to the slides. So as we send the slides out, um, you will just get some information. I use um, CDC. Their disability impact is all of us a web page for um, my stats. Um, like I did, I added the Orange Coast College Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Plan, and just some other resources that will help you and your campus and your institution on their quest to um, in changing that DEI to DEIA. So I want to thank you again. I really appreciate and all the questions and all the comments, and I thank you. All right.